mathematicians. We're in a war right now. You probably didn't know that because mathematicians are so low key. But how do we teach? They do have hunger strikes, though. How do we teach kids math? It's not like this is a known answer. It's like you're, you just asked a question. You're ready for a fist fight now. You know, people fight about this. And um, so, so Euclid's method, do we teach that in high school? No, we mostly don't. And why don't we? Well, we don't really have a good reason. Uh, we don't really know. So now I'm going to state legislatures. I'm not going, but I'm saying let's look at the state standards out there and see which, smart, which states include Euclid's method. Those are the smart states. It's like on news when they show certain states lift out in red. Those are the, where they have a little bit of brains. And, you know, I like states to compete. That's what we're part of in this, this particular country. Every state's supposed to be a laboratory, so I like to play with that. It's like, your state's not using Python. See, I come from Portland, and Christian Science Monitor said we're the open source capital of the world, okay? Who am I to disagree? Um, so when I go to, like, Lithuania, which I did for EuroPython or whatever, it's like, hey, I'm from Portland. You know, this is how we do it, okay? Get used to it. So I kind of... You know, it's like, this is the future. Now, I'm not really that hardcore, but I like math teachers when I talk to them to sort of get the feeling that this may actually be their future. I mean, this is a fun way to learn math. Kids beg me to, like, save them from their regular stuff. They come to my class at Saturday Academy. We do stuff like this. And on the last day, it's like, no, don't send me back to hell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I can't take it. <laughs> In my Python for math teachers, we usually start with a dog class and a monkey class, and then we create a mammal class and show how, you know, a little bit of polymorphism. Again, I don't have the burden of a CS1 curriculum. I'm not trying to make programmers. I'm trying to make people who understand fractions. Now, how do people understand fractions? Create a fraction object. Create a rational number class and add two fractions. What do you have to do? And then you have to simplify it. You have to get the lowest common denominator and all this kind of stuff. That's where Euclid's algorithm comes in. That's where all kinds of basic math comes in. So basically, we build math objects. We build fractions, probably one of the first ones. Then we build integers that add modulo something. So instead of 3 plus 2 equals 5, you get 3 plus 2 equals 2 or something because of the modulo. And there's a lot of little group theory things you can play with with modulo arithmetic that are very accessible to kids. I'm talking like high school. And one of the problems with the curriculum we have right now is we have what I call Calculus Mountain. Calculus Mountain is this killer. And we, the point of it, why it was put in there, is to kill most kids. It's like, if you can't make it through this mountain, then you're not going to go to college. You never have a technical career. You didn't know calculus or whatever. And so you kill a bunch of kids. It's kind of like that Lord of the Rings where they're trying to go over it before they try mortar. But, you know, it's like all that snow and everything. And uh, you lose most kids. And then on the other side of Calculus Mountain, there's this simple kind of group theory stuff and number theory that doesn't take a lot of background. You can do it in Python. And I call these the clear pools on the other side of Calculus Mountain. They're just so easy. They're just fun. You learn about totients and totatives and Euler and big names. And it's like, oh, I'm really learning math. Why didn't we just go around Calculus Mountain to those cliffs? Or at least have a chairlift, right? I, I, I hear people agreeing with that. We're also really uh, into visualization. This is another lesson plan for these kids. Basically, a generation or two or three before us have created Unix. They've created a command line. They've created piping. It's like our forebearers, our ancestors, who are still among us. I'm one of them. But we're, we've created a new culture here. It's this geek culture. And the point of education is not to always be the same, the same, the same. We need to now incorporate that, and kids need to start where we are, not where we were. So the command line has got to be part of an everyday high school experience or younger. So here they're learning how they can pipe things. This is some guy open source completely here, C++. I'm kind of off the topic of Python, but I'm just showing you that the wider curriculum, we're in a math curriculum here, includes feeling comfortable using POSIX, you know, the thing about where you can pipe things and stuff like that. That should just be part of everybody's Fluency now, nu numeracy now includes feeling comfortable um, stringing commands. I'm going to talk to you today about 
our evolution of a series of textbooks developed by Georges Cuisinaire, a Belgian maths teacher, elementary maths teacher, with the mathematician Caleb Gitanio. Gitanio's textbooks were popular in the 50s and 60s because they taught children object-oriented math. Young children were learning the math we now know as abstract data types. Instead of a curriculum based on the 18th century sequence of concepts, which you'll recall are sequence and order in year one, plus and minus in year two, multiply and divide in grade three, fractions as magnitudes, fractions as operators in grade four, and algebra in grade five, Gitanyu taught them all together in grade one for small numbers, and then he applied them in grade two to application domains like time, money, and speed. Okay. So these are two girls. One is known as 10K, and the other one is 401K. 10K uh, has a Tizard test. We give the kids a test every, every 10 hours. We go into the classroom and uh, work with the teachers on a test that we design with the teacher. The teacher gives us the standard test of what they're expected in, to have achieved, and we design what we call a formative assessment or algebra, algebraic test. So here's an example. We show the children a diagram. We give them a name, G, pipe, R, pipe, W. And we say, how many trains, how many rods put together will have a diagram like that? If the rule for making a diagram, it's called a ferro diagram, if you look it up in Google, is the rods, in, the cars in the train, when you put them left justified, top down, can't get any bigger as you go down. Does that make sense? OK, so what the children are asked to do is, first of all, give it a name. Well, this child's given it the name staircase. and then. She's asked, if that's the standard name, G, pipe, R, pipe, W, what other trains, paper trains, can make that? How many of them are there, and what are they called? So that's the warm-up question. And then they go into working independently on examples of that. So Tell me, what, did, what was your answer? Um, well, I liked working with the rods because they helped me understand quite a lot. And when we started doing new work, we... Um, we, well, when we started doing the parity ones and parity zeros, we um, learned um, more about maths. We learned that there was more to it than just, um, just numbers and times and dividing. And we learned that there's, there are um, different signs you can use for different things. And, the, and um, with the, when we did fractions, um, I found that quite hard, but when we when we done a little bit more of it, when we kept on going over the same things, I found it getting easier and easier. And I liked um, I liked making um, I like making problems, and then um, like when we worked in partners, our partners had to try and work them out. And I liked it. Um, I think that the rods um, really help you with maths and more schools should use them.